Hello and welcome to Evangel Wichita Online. We are so glad you're here to worship with us today. If you're a guest with us or you would like more information about our church, go to evangelwichita.org slash connect and we'll get in touch with you soon. Now, while you're on our website, take advantage of our online giving. Whether you're being obedient in your tithes or going beyond that in generosity and sacrifice with missions and other giving, you can do it right there on the website and it's so simple. We're having in-person services here at Evangel. So whenever you're comfortable, we would love to have you and your family join us at 10 a.m. every Sunday morning. We have our nursery and our kids' church open, so there's something for them all the way up to fifth grade. And then teenagers join us in the sanctuary as well. Then on Wednesday nights, for grades six through 12, for our students at 7 p.m., we have our student ministry happening every Wednesday night. Your teenagers will wanna be a part of that. And now as we get ready to worship together, can we prepare our hearts? Can you join me in prayer as we get ready to worship the King of Kings? So God, we thank you so much. You are so good. And Father, as we worship you now, I pray that your name is honored and glorified above every other name. And as we study your word, as we look to the Psalms, God, may you speak to us. May your Holy Spirit convict us and correct us where we need it. We open our hearts to what you would have to say to us today. So God, we love you and we thank you in Jesus name. Amen. So go ahead, stand with us, get ready to worship, and here we go. God, 
as you come will you meet me here again is all I want is all you are will you meet me here again ourselves in a valley or in a spot where we didn't think that we would ever be God but you're there you never leave us alone you never forsake us Jesus surround your children with your presence Lord just surround us 
God, I pray that you would continue to move in this service, Lord. Speak through your word and help us to learn who you are. Help us to be assured by your word that you are the true and faithful God. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. Amen. Welcome to Evangel Online. We are so glad you're watching today. I am excited because I am believing and praying that as we move forward in our relationship with God, we are going to be led to a life of infinitely more through the power of the Holy Spirit. I am believing that. I am praying for that. So it's amazing. Thanks for watching wherever you are today. We are in a series taken from Psalm 23. I mean, Psalm 23, one of the most beloved and and well-known passages in the Bible. This amazing psalm was written by King David, the most famous king in the history of Israel. And we see him write this as king, but it reflects back to his beginnings. And as many of you know, David was the youngest of his brothers and youngest of Jesse's sons, and he was a shepherd by trade. So he's writing as king, looking back at his humble beginnings as a shepherd. And what I love about Psalm 23 is that it tells us what God is really like. I want you to understand this. Psalm 23 gives us a clear picture of God. And I'm believing that when we finish this study on Psalm 23, we will know what God looks like. We will know more of who he is and and we will realize how much he loves each of us and, and how much we really matter to him. Because here's what I believe, and here's what I want you to get, and this is a a major point of what we're talking about. I believe the more you understand God, the more you'll trust him. And the more you trust him, the more you'll move into a place of infinitely more. You see, the more you understand God, the easier it will be for you to trust him. And the, the more you trust him, the more you'll move into a place of infinitely more. I don't know about you, but I've mentioned this each week. Um, It seems like over the last several months, my stress level has gone up in different areas. Maybe some areas it's gone down, but in other areas it's gone up. And as new things and new challenges happen each and every day, it's like I deal with different types of stress in my life. As I would think that these changes would make my life easier, but it seems like there's different stressors that have come up. And maybe like you, it seems to me that the uncertainty of everything that we're facing has led to more stress in our life. That's why we're studying Psalm 23 together. We're all facing stress. Yeah, I get it. We're all facing stress. And we're talking in Psalm 23 about the greatest stressors that we may face in our life today. And we're looking at Psalm 23 and we're seeing the antidotes to those stressors. You see, I believe that these types of stress that we're looking at in Psalm 23, the types of stress that you may be dealing with in your life today will ultimately interfere with you moving into a life of infinitely more with God. So we looked at our first stress, that was worry. We said, the Lord is my shepherd. He's my Lord first and he's my shepherd. And when he's my shepherd, what is there to worry about? We looked at busyness. We all need a relationship with Christ and it will help set the pace in our life. We cannot set the pace. We need a pace setter in our life and that's giving it up to God, giving our our life up to God and and letting Christ set the pace in our life. Last week, we started talking about emotional damage, emotional baggage that we are carrying. And we're gonna continue talking about that today today. So let's look at Psalm 23 together. Verse one, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and your love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Last week, we started talking about the antidote to to damaged emotions. And I mentioned that 
for this forced solitude that many of us have gone through these last few months and, and the way things have changed so quickly around us and the way we've had to be socially distant from those people for many weeks, it gave the opportunity for for us to examine and to see deep emotional hurts and pain. And for many of you, it's been a difficult time that these emotional pains have come up and you have a choice that you can either confront the hurt or pain or you can ignore it and try to stay busy. And last week we started in verse three of Psalm 23. It says, he refreshes my soul. Some versions say he restores my soul my soul. And this is very good news because I mentioned to you last week that that all of us periodically need to have our soul refreshed. We all get hurt. We all get beat up by discouragement. We all deal with frustrations. We all deal with despair at some time. We have fatigue. We have failures. We have fears. We all have hidden hurts from our past that if we don't deal with, they'll come back up. We carry wounds. And God wants to take away your emotional baggage. He wants to get rid of the emotional garbage that you deal with every single day. He wants to refresh and restore your soul. The big question is how? How does he do it? When you make these three changes in your life, number one, you let God remove your guilt. And we talked about that last week. Let God remove your guilt first. No other way it works. God has to do it. Number two, let God relieve my grief and let God replace my grudges. Guilt, grief, grudges, the three things are keeping you in emotional instability. So let's finish with the last two today. We need to let God relieve our grief. We need need to let God relieve our grief. So here's something that I want to acknowledge. Now, all the things that I deal with in my life Not all of the things that damage me, I bring on myself. That's the reality. There are issues and things that you're facing, that you're dealing with, that you did not ask for. Sometimes the reality is I have grief because of what others have done to me. Sometimes I may even have grief over how other people are hurt or how other people are treated. I had a conversation the other day with someone talking about all the hurt and pain that's happening in our, in our country and around our world today. And the comment they made ultimately was, when will all of this be over? When will we be past all of these things? And, and I was reminded that the reality of it is we won't be completely better until Jesus returns. So there is this fact in life that we will be hurt. This is not paradise. This is not heaven. It's imperfect here. There is sin in the world. It is imperfect. And maybe you're watching today and you are dealing with emotions that are pretty intense. You've been hurt in a relationship. You you find yourself in a place today where it seems that no one even cares about you. Um, Maybe you're in a place where you've been rejected and it's real for you. Maybe you're in a place watching this today and loneliness has set in. I'm here to tell you, God is here. He is with you and he cares about you. But you're asking the question, Mark, what do I do when my heart is breaking? When grief is so overwhelming in my life, what do I do? And I would say to you, instead of throwing in the towel, I would say, come to the shepherd who wants to restore or refresh your soul. King David wrote these words because he was very acquainted with grief. If you look at Psalm 31, verse nine, David writes these words. He says, be merciful to me, Lord, for I am in distress. My eyes grow weak with sorrow, my soul and body with grief. This same David gives us tips on how to handle grief. You see, if we read the story of David through the Old Testament, he had his ups and downs and we see all those things play out. We have more written about David in in the Bible than anyone else. He, He is in a place where he's committed adultery and then murder and he's carried guilt over his sin and he comes to confess it to God. And you know what happens when he comes and confesses it to God? We see restoration happen. We read all about it in Psalm 51. You can go there and see. If you are dealing with guilt, 
this is a good place to start, Psalm 51. But then you read more of the story of David in 2 Samuel chapter 12. You see, David gives us tips on what we can do with the grief. How do we handle the grief? Even when we've messed up, when it's something we've done, how do we handle the grief? See, in David's life, the baby that was born because of what David had done was sick. And so David begins to pray for the baby. He begins to fast for the baby. But you know what happens? The baby dies. And the point is not that the baby died, but what David does next. These are the things that you need to do if God is going to restore your soul today. If you want to handle the grief, this is what you need to do. Look what David did. First, David accepted what could not be changed. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 22. He answered, David, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. I thought, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. Verse 23, but now that he is dead, why should I go on fasting? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. See, David got to a place. He accepted what cannot be changed. I cannot change my background. I cannot change the hurts I've experienced. I cannot change these things in the past and neither can you. This is the first key here to peace of mind. You need to accept what cannot be changed. If you want to deal with the grief. Second, I would say to you, play it down and pray it up. Play it down and pray it up. Look, don't exaggerate it. Give it to God. You're going to be hurt in life but what you do with it afterward is up to you. I mean, I have the habit, I don't know if you've ever can tell, but I have the habit of making everything I go through a national disaster in my mind. My, my, my kids and my family can relate. I can make such a huge deal before I ever even pray about the situation. But look what David, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 20. Then David got up from the ground. Watch what he did. He got up from the ground. After he had washed, put on lotions and changed his clothes, he went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Then he went to his own house and at his request, they served him food and he ate. What did he do? He went to church and he spent time worshiping God. And that changed his perspective and gave him strength to carry on through the grief. Third, focus on what's left, not what was lost. 2 Samuel 12, 24. Then David um, comforted his wife, Bathsheba, and he went to her and made love to her. She gave birth to a son and they named him Solomon. If you're going through grief today, remember that God is still God. He is not finished with you. It may hurt today, but it's not over. Let God relieve your grief today. We see amazing words in scripture about this. Isaiah, the prophet in the Old Testament, writes about the year of the Lord's favor and some amazing things. Isaiah 61, look at the end of verse two and verse three. It says, Isaiah writes these, to comfort all who mourn, verse three, and provide for those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. I need to come to a place where I let God remove my guilt. We talked about that. But then right here, I need to let God relieve my grief. Let God relieve your grief. What is it that you are facing today? What grief are you dealing with today? And then third, to deal with these, to, to, to refresh my soul. Let God replace my grudges. This is hard. So I started by defining the word grudge. What is a grudge? It's defined this way, a feeling of ill will or resentment. The verse or the sentence to describe the definition says, to hold a grudge against a former opponent. Hmm, how many of us are dealing with grudges today? Where do they come from? 
I mean, have you asked yourself that? Well, they come from where other people have done to us, correct? It's like, I may feel guilty about what I've done to others, but grudges come into play based on what other people have done to me. And so the truth is, the hard part, is that I'm going to be hurt in life. There, it's going to happen. People will fail me. That's a fact of life. People will hurt you. Sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. But the point is this, how you handle the resentments of life determine whether you are, get this, a bitter person or a better person. You see, there's just one letter difference, isn't there? Bitter or better. The difference is the letter I. And so what does that mean? I make the choice if I'm going to be bitter or better. I choose whether the circumstance will devastate me or direct me to a new path. I choose. I choose whether this circumstance will make me bitter or better. So then the question, Mark, 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 what do I do then? with all of the hurts that have piled up? What do I do with all of the emotional garbage that I still resent? What, what do I do with those people and the feelings that, that when those people come to my mind, it just tightens my stomach up. And I just feel sick almost sometimes when you mention a name and, and that name comes up and I think about what they did to me and it just, rolls, it just gets all inside me. What, what do I do? We see in Job 5.2, we read this, resentment kills a fool and envy slays the simple. You see this, here's what I've learned and I am learning this myself. I'm talking to myself and I'm talking to you today. Resentment never hurts the other person. It only hurts you. Resentment never hurts the other person. And I've had to deal with this in my own life. I'm, I've had to deal with this. I mean, the reality is the resentment that I'm holding on to towards another person. Oftentimes, that person is totally clueless that I'm even thinking about them. That person is often clueless that I'm holding a grudge against them. That person is often clueless that every time their name is mentioned to me, it makes me tense up. You see, that person has moved on with their life. But we are allowing that person to continue to hurt us today. We are refusing to move on from where we were. We are allowing the past to hurt us today. Job 18.4 says, this only hurts us. You who tear yourself to pieces in anger. So the, 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 the question becomes, what do I do with my grudges? What do I do with the resentments that I'm holding towards people who have legitimately hurt me today. Paul shares some insight with us, Romans 12, 19. He says this, listen, Paul writes this. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. Let me tell you something that's very obvious. Because there is sin in the world today, Life is not fair. And here's the other reality. God said life, he never said life would be fair. We have seen with our own eyes that justice is not always served in this world. Why? Because this world is sinful. Jesus has not returned yet. We are still living in a broken world. But, Paul's reminding us here in Romans that one day God will settle the score. One day God is going to call into account. One day God is going to right the wrong, settle the issues that we that, that were left unsettled here, the crimes, the injustice, the prejudice, the racism, the sexism, the rapes, murders, hurts, abuse. One day God's going to settle the score. And God says it's his job to handle that. So then Mark, what, what do I need to do instead? What should I do? Ephesians 4, Paul writes these words. Ephesians 4, 31, he says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. But instead, look at verse 32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, 
forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Listen, if you have been forgiven today, God expects you to be forgiving of other people. And don't worry, don't worry, listen. You will never have to forgive another person more than God has already forgiven you. You will never have to forgive another person more than God has already forgiven you. Let that sink in for a moment when you push back. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, bitterness is blindness. Bitterness is blindness. You see what happens when bitterness comes in and the grudges get there. It allows the hurt to make me bitter and it blinds me. It blinds me to the truth. It blinds me to what God wants to do in my life. I cannot see when I'm bitter. I've been blinded. And the hard thing to understand today while you're watching and you're dealing with this emotion, emotional problems, it's the hard, you will never be healed from your hurt until you accept God, until you accept his forgiveness through Jesus Christ. And then you have to offer that forgiveness to other people. So here's the application today. Here are the questions that you need to ask yourself to bring it and make this real. What about your grief? Are you letting your grief incapacitate you today? You need to come to God who can relieve your grief. What about this? And this may impact more people. What about your grudges? Are you still allowing people in your past to continue to hurt you in the present? The past is past. The past is gone. I would say to you, give your grudges to God. Psalm 23 says, he refreshes my soul. He restores my soul. Jesus, the shepherd, the, your Lord wants to come and heal your damaged emotions. He will restore your soul if you let him, but you have to let him be your shepherd. You have to let him be your savior today. I want to close this session talking about verse three. By looking at another psalm and a verse that David has written, it's Psalm 42, five. And it asks this question, why my soul are you downcast? Some versions say, why my soul are you cast down? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my savior and my God. I want to ask you this as we wrap this up. Do you, do you have a cast down soul? Now, many of you are confused watching. What does that mean, Mark? What does it mean to have a cast down soul? What's interesting is David here is using a term every shepherd would understand when he talks about being cast down. Now, of course, we're, we're looking around going, well, how many shepherds are watching today? I don't, I don't get it. So I, have to, so I looked this up. If this is a term that shepherds would know, I looked up the cast down sheep. And that is a little, you can Google it today and find videos of cast down sheep. It is a position that sheep get themselves in and cannot get themselves out of. Sheep are built in such a way that if they fall on their side and then over on their back with their legs, legs sticking straight up, they cannot get themselves out of that position and they are helpless to get back on their feet again. And you know what happens? In this position, the, the sheep will kick and flail their legs in the air. It will begin to cry out. Why? Because it knows in this position, it is vulnerable to attack. Any animal can come and attack it at this moment. It often happens to sheep who are pregnant. It's a very serious condition, actually. When they lay on their back like this, the gas begins to collect in their stomach. It hardens their stomach. It cuts off the air and they suffocate in, in literally a matter of hours. Not only that, their legs go numb. So on a hot day, a sheep in a cast down position can die in a matter of hours. They can't do anything about it. They are incapable, incapable of saving themselves. They need a shepherd who restores them. So here's what the shepherd does. When a shepherd restores a cast down sheep, it doesn't just happen immediately, but a shepherd will come, find the sheep laying on their back, 
and seeing their legs, they may have to massage the legs for a few moments to try to get blood flowing back in the legs. They will hold the sheep very carefully. They will lift the sheep up and carry it over back onto its legs, putting its hand under the sheep's belly because the legs are going to be wobbly as the sheep tries to stand up. He will lift the sheep up and hold it there until the sheep has its equilibrium about it, until it can stand on its own. So the blood begins to flow to the legs. Its circulation begins to happen. The, the instability becomes stable and the sheep finally can stand on its own. And when the shepherd realizes that the sheep can stand on its own, he, he steps back and lets the sheep go to run back to the flock. And this is an amazing picture that David is showing of what God wants to do for you when you're on your back and you're flailing around in grief, guilt, and grudges are overwhelming you, and you think that you're going to die in this position, here's the key. The Lord is your shepherd. He lovingly comes, and he, he brings reassuring words, tender hands, picks you up, his little lamb, and says, I am going to set you straight until you can get on your feet again. And once you're there, once the equilibrium is there again, I, and your stability is back, I'm going to let you go. You see, Jesus will restore your soul today. If you've been cast down for any reason, he is the only one who can get you back up on your feet again. And when he restores your soul, he restores your confidence. He will restore your joy. He will restore your peace, restore your strength. And it only comes from God. Psalm 23, three, he refreshes my soul. He restores my soul. So today, if you're watching this and you need to make the Lord your shepherd first, you need to make him Lord. This is your opportunity. This is your moment. You're dealing with all these situations and the first steps that you make Jesus your Lord. You make Jesus your Lord today. Once he's your Lord, then, then he can be your shepherd. But if you need to make him Lord today, you need to just pause right now and pray, God, I acknowledge I need you today. I need Jesus to forgive. I need Jesus to restore. I give my life to Jesus. I accept what he's done for me. I want him to be Lord of my life. Lord of my life. And when you do that, you start a brand new life. Last, do you need to restore your soul? Are you dealing with grief? Are you dealing with grudges? Let the shepherd restore refresh your cast downness. Let him, let him come today. Give those things to the shepherd today. Beautiful words in Psalm 23, three. He refreshes my soul. He refreshes my soul. He restores my soul today. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. If you made decision to follow Jesus Christ, or you just want more information about our church, Go to evangelwichita.org slash connect and one of our pastors will be in touch with you soon. Now again, we're having in-person services right now. So we would love to have you join us next Sunday morning at 10 a.m. So until next week, we'll see you.